Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Prosperity Through Multifamily Real Estate Investing Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Cody Laughlin, and joining me again today on the show is Mr. Brian Alfaro. Brian, good morning. How are you? I'm doing well. Good morning. How are you? I'm doing great, man. Doing great. Looking forward to our very special guest today. But before we get to that, I want to remind the audience to make, a, make sure to jump over to Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. Please make sure to subscribe to the show and download today's episode. And make sure to leave us a written rating and review. We really appreciate your feedback and help getting the show out there. Also, if we have not connected with you yet, we'd love to do so on social media. You can check us out on Facebook, LinkedIn, and you can follow us on Instagram. And if you want to learn more about me and John and Brian over there and what we're doing at Blue Oak Capital, check us out at www.blueoakinvest.com. So with that, our very special guest joining us today is Mr. Todd Miller. Todd, good morning. How are you? Good morning. How are you guys doing today? I appreciate you having me. Yeah, man. We, we appreciate you being on the show. Looking forward to our conversation, man. So um, before we get to our conversation, let's tell the audience a little bit more about you, Todd. So Todd, uh, after graduating cum laude from, with a degree in finance from the University of Florida, uh, that's Gators, right? You got it, man. Go Gators. <laughs> yeah, you're a rival. We'll have to talk about that a little later. But uh, <laughs> Todd started working for a Fortune uh, Global 500 company. Less than a year later, he got laid off due to the Great Recession. During this difficult period, he committed to living on his terms and becoming financially independent. Todd dreamed of working less experience, excuse me, working less, experiencing more and becoming financially, excuse me, Todd dreamed of working less, experiencing more and spending time with the most important people in his life. For the next 11 years, he worked in financial services, guiding thousands of people through the mortgage approval process. All the while, he saved, invested and built passive income for the future. Then at 35, Todd accomplished his goal and became financially independent. He went on he went on bucket list adventures around the world and eventually started tightwadtod.com. I love that title, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this coaching business is a way for him to follow another passion, helping others. Its mission is financial education so everyone can achieve their goals faster, live free, and have more fulfilled lives. So Todd, man, again, looking forward to our conversation. Tell us a little bit more about you and your background. Yeah, man. Uh, again, thanks for having me on here. Really, really happy to be here and kind of share my story a little bit with you guys and, and your audience, of course. Um, so I guess my whole, my whole journey to financial freedom and financial independence started in college. Um, I learned really about it for the first time reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad, like I'm sure a lot of people did. You know, this is a, a brand new concept <laughs> in that you didn't have to work for 40 years or your entire life to, to reach retirement. You know, there was a, another path. And I was thinking that this is a great path, you know, if anything I can do to, to really live life how I wanted to live it on my terms and have all the great experiences that I dreamed of, you know, that just sound like, sounded like a great option. So I read that book and then I immediately picked up uh, the four hour work week. So my mind was just kind of like blown at that point. I was like, wow, so you can work for, you know, just a couple hours a week. You don't have to put in 40 hours a week and you can live this incredible lifestyle. So from then, you know, I just, I was, I was hooked. Um, you know, I started reading everything I could get my hands on um, and really just started all out pursuing the goal of financial independence. So while I was in school, I was studying uh, business and, and finance. And um, while I was taking those classes, I uh, ended up starting a, a couple of small businesses. Um, and that really helped me kind of put the things that I was learning in school and, and putting it into like a world, real world situation. Um, so one of the first things I started doing was, um, as you alluded to, you know, I went to the University of Florida, go Gators. And um, every year, you know, we would, we would go to all these great bowl games. Um, and a lot of my friends, you know, they weren't, weren't all that interested in, in making the flight or whatever to, uh, to go see the Gators play. So I would get their student IDs and I would go uh, and buy student tickets um, from the ticket office. So I'd end up, you know, getting an extra 10 or 15 tickets and I'd, I'd put them on eBay and sell them on eBay and make a couple hundred bucks um, every time I did that. So I was like, hey, this is pretty cool and pretty easy at the same time. So I started thinking, you know, what else can I do to, to generate a little bit more income? Um, so a friend of mine and I came up with the idea that, hey, what if we started buying and selling textbooks? So um, at the end of every, every semester, you know, we would go around to our buddies and buy up all their, their textbooks, make it real nice and easy for them. 
I uh, give them some cash, they give us the books, and then same kind of thing. We turn around a couple of weeks later and start shipping out textbooks all over the country. Um, so, you know, make, made a little bit more, you know, money to, uh, to live on for, for a couple of months. So I was thinking, wow, all right, so I can only do this, you know, two or three times a year. What can I do that's, you know, maybe something a little bit more consistent? So I got the idea that um, I was going to start buying and selling cell phones. Um, so somehow I connected with uh, with a couple of people, and um, and they were, um, you know, kind of like cell phone wholesalers to a degree. Um, so I started buying, you know, maybe 20 cell phones at a time and put them up on eBay, make a little profit, turn around and buy some more, and kind of keep doing that, and that sort of funded my college lifestyle, so to speak, for a while. <laughs> so uh, I, I don't know, I guess that's a little bit of a of hustle there, you know, um, kind of getting the whole business mindset and um, and kind of working towards towards the goals that I had at the time. Um, so as, uh, as I'm kind of going through this process, um, you know, I, I eventually had to graduate. So I uh, ended up getting a job with a, uh, a a Fortune Global 500 company, which uh, which is you know really great. Um, but uh, at the time, you know, I really thought that I was living out more of of the dream that my parents had set up for me, not really the dream that I had. Um, so you know, things took an unexpected turn a couple of months later when I got laid off, and um, you know, it was it was part of the the Great Recession, and um, <clears throat> you know, it was it was, a, it was a tough couple of months in my life where. I wasn't sure, you know, what direction I wanted to go in, what I really wanted to do next. Um, but then I, I really started thinking about, you know, the whole rich dad, poor dad concept and <clears throat> wanting to live life on my terms. And that's ultimately what I decided was that I didn't want a, a company to have this much control over my life and to be able to, you know, turn me off or cut me at any point that they, they didn't think I was a good performer. So um, from that point on, I really, you know, dove even further into finances and budgeting and, and committing to, to, to savings so that I could invest in, and grow this passive income. Um, so eventually I, I took a job in, um, in mortgage banking. And while I was in mortgage banking, you know, I was able to look at you know, thousands of people's personal finance situation. So I saw everything, you know, from from hourly workers to doctors and lawyers, you know, making hundreds of thousands of dollars every year. And it was really eye opening because it was very in line with what I had read and learned um, as part of the millionaire next door is that, you know, there's a lot of people out there that are living a certain lifestyle and they portray their lives a certain way to the world, but they really don't have any true net worth or anything to show for it. They're living paycheck to paycheck. Um, so that was a really eye-opening kind of experience for me. And, and so again, you know, I was, I was diving into my own personal finance journey at this point, kind of comparing myself to what I saw some of my clients were doing and that, you know, the, the people that had true net worth um, and really had built something would live well below their means and that they would save and invest, you know, everything that they could. And so I kind of followed that model and I just began, you know, putting money away. I wasn't sure what I was going to invest in at that point. I just knew that, you know, I needed to have money so that when I f found out and figured it out, you know, it would be there and I could start pulling the trigger. So this is, um, you know, right around 2010, 2011, um, the, you know, we just suffered a huge real estate crash and, um, and I was in mortgage banking. And uh, a couple of a couple of buddies of mine had started a real estate company and they were looking for some private lenders. So I said, hey, you know, I know a little bit about mortgage. I've been doing this for a couple of years. So let me try funding some of your, some of your deals. So um, I started working with them, funding some of their deals and things, you know, worked out pretty well for the first six or 12 months. And then I was like, well, you know, shoot, you guys are doing this. Why don't I just start buying the houses and, you know, make a little bit more money. <laughs> so I did. So, uh, so from there I started, started buying and, and holding properties and renting them out and, uh, you know, build up a, a nice little portfolio over this, this period of time. And, um, and, and over time, um, you know, I was able to just kind of keep building things up and, um, you know, slowly, slowly over time, uh, my passive income grew and I was able to, to start replacing, you know, some of my monthly expenses. So, um, you know, I was able to start paying, 
you know, like my car, my, my car bill. And I was able to start paying my electric bill. And, you know, I had a roommate that was living with me in my house. So he was covering most of my mortgage. Um, so I was really, you know, able to knock my, my expenses low and, you know, st still keep producing at my job and earning a significant income and kind of stashing money away all at the same time and, you know, waiting for the next property to, to come up so that I could start bidding on it. Um, so started in single single family and then eventually got into uh, to duplexes and quads, um, and then slowly over time I started learning more about uh, about multifamily, and uh, and I guess that's really where um, where I, I, I try and focus most of my investment dollars in today's market. Um, even though you know kind of hard to find deals at this point in time, but uh, you know there's just so many great benefits of owning multifamily real estate. Um, you know, I wish I would have found out about it, you know, 10 years ago, it would have been, would have been great. Um, I love the more hands-off approach to it, you know, that you're factoring in property management. That's not an added expense. Like it is more in the single family market. Um, things are just underwritten differently. And um, I just, I just really love that model. Um, and, I, and throughout my process, you know, I also had a lot of setbacks. Um, I remember, one of the first houses I bought, I was, I was moving in one of my residents and, um, and they, you know, they were unpacking and, and I was kind of showing them around and I was like, Oh, you know, they were really liking the house. And I left and then I got a call later that night and they had a plumbing leak and completely flooded the entire house. And I was back out there in the, you know, the next morning and I, I, I felt terrible. So I was, you know, they asked if they could move out and I said, sure, you know, I, I didn't, know what the heck to do at that point. <laughs> um, so they moved out, um, you know, had plenty of places, with, a couple of places with evictions and, you know, tenant damage and that kind of thing. Um, and then uh, about uh, eight years ago, uh, I had another huge event in my life, which is where my, my dad died. And that kind of changed my, my perspective on a lot of things as well. Um, uh, I really started thinking about my life and what, how I wanted to spend my time again. And and that, you know, life is really short, you know, we're, we don't know how long we're here for. Um, so that kind of fueled my fire again to become financially independent. So I, you know, I dove in even harder this time and, and kept working after it. And I really wanted to, to have these awesome bucket list adventures and be able to travel the world and have all these great memories and, and share, you know, my time with, with my family and the people that I loved. Um, so, you know, eventually about uh, 11 years after I made the promise to myself, um, I reached financial independence um, and kind of as my, my reward, uh, my fiance and I uh, decided that we wanted to travel the world for a year. Um, so the first thing we did was head over to Spain and, uh, and we walked uh, the Camino de Santiago across northern Spain, which is like a 550 mile walk. Um, so that was an awesome experience for us. Um, we hit up uh, like the Tour de France. Um, and eventually made our way over to Southeast Asia for, for like six months and went surfing and took all these great uh, motorbike trips around Thailand and things like that. But all in the back of, the, of my mind, I, I realized um, that, you know, I wasn't going to be able to live that kind of a lifestyle for too long. I had the itch to keep, keep going and, and producing and finding out kind of what my, my next step was going to be in life. Um, so I started thinking about, you know, some of the problems that I saw in the world. And um, one thing that I really noticed over in Asia was that, um, you know, there's, they have a trash and a trash problem. And, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of countries ship their trash over to Asia uh, and, and let them kind of deal with it. Um, so they, so when we were in Thailand, they actually instituted a plastic bag ban, uh, which I thought was, was pretty, pretty cool that, you know, a whole country could come together and say, hey, we're not gonna take plastic bags anymore because you know we think they're they're detrimental to the environment so that was one of the things i thought was was pretty interesting and then i really started thinking about you know my own path and my own talents and um realized that you know i think i have a have uh, a a unique knowledge base in personal finance and being able to kind of explain things simply to people and ultimately i decided that that's the the path that i wanted to take was to to help people be able to reach their own dreams and to have, uh, you know, a better lifestyle and to spend, be able to spend time with their friends and family and not have to worry about, you know, what the, their boss tells them to do. You know, I couldn't imagine being, you know, a 50 or 60 year old guy and taking orders from a boss. 
that just that sounds miserable to me as a, as a grown man. <laughs> um, so, you know, for the most part, that's uh, that's what how I how I ended up in coaching, and um, you know, I'm just just happy that uh, that I can have a positive influence on others. Wow. Man, that, that's awesome! The tr- tremendous story, and and, and I, I love the fact that you know you as you mentioned, you started out hustling and getting creative in, in finding ways to create some income while you're in college, you know, which is just, just pure, you know, it's abilities of a, a entrepreneur, a successful entrepreneur is being able to be creative and just constantly finding different ways to, to create income. But, um, you know, and then, you, you know, as a real estate entrepreneur, you just really kind of follow the journey that we're all taught, you know, and is, you know, get into investment real estate, you buy and hold, you, you, you have the passive income and, and you do that often enough. And eventually it grows to where now, as you mentioned, you've reached financial independence. You've been able to travel the world. Now you're helping others do the same and, and uh, just, just phenomenal story, man. Absolutely love it. So Thanks, appreciate man. you appreciate sharing it. that. <laughs> I, I got to go back and reference. So I mentioned your arrival, right? So I'm from Louisiana. So big LSU. Fan, oh so, man. Uh, <laughs> so <I'll, laughs> but, uh, but no, anyway, man, so that's great. Uh, Love it. So, so talk to us a little bit more about, you know, you mentioned how you kind of started living under your means. You really started like really micromanaging your, your, your finances, if you will. Talk to us about that strategy and and how important that was to helping you build your business. Yeah. So I guess the the whole premise for me was um, the more, the more money that I could save and invest, um, the more streams of income I could have. So while I was buying, you know, football tickets and textbooks and cell phones and all these things, um, I was kind of limited by the amount of capital that I had. So the more capital I had, the more of these products I could could go out and buy and in turn, you know, make a profit on. Um, so that kind of started that whole, that whole journey. Um, so, you know, the three parts of a budget really are the income, the expenses and the savings. And that's not too different than, you know, what you see in multifamily either. You know, you have the income, you have the expenses, and you have the net operating income. Um, so really, it was just focusing on each of those areas and, and doing what I could to maximize my income, um, to reduce my expenses, which would allow me to save the most amount of money while still, you know, having being able to enjoy my life and my time. Um, so, you know, some ways that, that a lot of people look to increase their income, you know, Investing is, is one aspect. Uh, most people start by, um, you know, trying to get a raise at their job or something like that. That's probably the, the easiest avenue for most people is, you know, talking to their boss or looking to change, change to a different company and getting a pay raise that way. Um, of course, side hustling, it seems to be a hot topic at the point at this point in time. So, you know, a lot of people are, are looking at different ways that, you know, they can start up some sort of, a, you know, a freelancing business or some sort of a business just, just to grow that income. Um, but for me, I always found that it was easier for me to, to reduce expenses, um, kind of part of the, the reason that I got the nickname Tightwad Todd. <laughs> um, so it was easy for me to, to go in and to cut out the things that, that weren't that important in my life. Um, so for instance, I'm not, a, I'm not a big person that needs to go out and, and dine in restaurants or anything like that. So I'm okay to do that a couple of times a month, but I don't need to do that a couple of times a week. Um, so I was able to, to cut that out. Um, and then of course, you know, I took on a roommate. So, you know, that helped to reduce my largest expense, which was, you know, my housing expense. Um, and so I just, just kind of looked at my overall budget to see where my money was going every month and what I was spending on and determining what was most important to me and being able to cut out the things or reduce my spending in the areas that really weren't all that important. So I took all of these steps which ultimately allowed me to save more money. Um, and so with savings allowed, that allowed me to invest into uh, these single family properties, you know, um, fund some of these mortgage deals and eventually grow uh, the, the rental income to, to be able to retire early. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's, a, that's amazing. Uh, I'm actually a personal finance nerd as well. <laughs> Probably not as knowledgeable as you. Uh, but one of the things I did out of college as well was uh, kind of look around at my peers, and I'm, I'm sure you've had this similar uh, epiphany. And you know, 
what I like to tell people is you can actually give yourself a raise by reducing your expenses. You know, most people, like you said, look around and say like, how do I you know, make more money? Do I need a, we're naturally taught, go work harder, go work more hours, or even maybe go get a second job, you know, go start delivering pizzas or driving Ubers or something like that. But if you, you know, save 50 bucks a month, on something, you just gave yourself a $600 a year raise. You know, that's, that's kind of how I like to ex explain things to people. Um, and I think having that mentality can be hugely beneficial so that you're not constantly feeling like, you know, uh, do I have to work harder? Do I have to work harder? Because there's uh, diminishing returns on working harder. I think, you know, you can only work so many hours in a day. And um, I know you, you figured that out, you know, you, you read the four hour work week, like I did and, and the millionaire <laughs> next door and all these different books. And uh, the reality is, is you can, uh, you can do more with less. So having that, that uh, minimalist sort of mentality, I think is beneficial. Is that something that you uh, do your coaching program kind of, kind of teach your, your students? Most definitely. Yeah. So I, I kind of noticed the same thing that you talked about is that a lot of my peers, you know, when we were in our early twenties, they were out buying, you know, brand new fancy cars and that kind of thing. And um, specifically, I remember a couple of friends buying boats and, and, you know, maybe they were able to use it a couple of times a month. Um, but other than that, it just kind of sat in their garage. And I just just really didn't understand um, what they were kind of doing with their money. Um, so I, I decided to just take a completely different approach in that, you know, it was okay to, to go and, 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 you know, spend time on a boat, but you didn't have to necessarily own a boat. You could go rent one for an afternoon. You, you weren't locked into feeling like you needed to go out every Saturday on the boat to make sure you were Justifying. getting your money's worth out of your boat. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, justifying your purchase kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no, that's definitely, definitely a part of it. Um, a lot of people that I work with, you know, transportation is, is another large expense that a lot of people have and, you know, a luxury car in my opinion um, isn't all that different from, you know, a, a five or 10 year old car, you know, they both get you from point A to point B. Uh, one just, you know, has a multi hundred dollar payment per month and the other one, you know, is significantly less. Um, so in my opinion, it's, it's, it's not a big deal to, to buy the vehicle that has the lower monthly payment because it does the same thing as the luxury car. Absolutely. And with cars, uh, I'm a, I like to talk a lot about cars too, because I think, uh, <laughs> you know, cars are one of the things that uh, Americans have a fascination with. You know, we love our cars. I love muscle cars and motorcycles and things like the next person. But uh, I always like to tie in, uh, and I'm sure you've used this before, like compound interest and how powerful it is. You know, if you were to take your three or four or five hundred dollar a month uh, car payment and from 21 years old to 65, invested in a really safe, really simple, uh, you know, mutual fund. You know, something really simple that gets you six, seven percent. By the time you retire, you'd have over a million dollars. So, you know, if you ask the average person, like, hey, would you rather drive a nice car that's going to cost you $500 a month for 40 years, or you can wait 40 years, and I'm going to give you a million dollars. Unfortunately, our behaviors are, ch are showing that we're actually <laughs> choosing the car um, right. versus choosing the, uh, you know, the, the, the savings. So I think it's really, it's a really interesting conversation to have with somebody the first time. I'm sure you have some you probably see your students' faces, their lights, their eyes just light up when you have some of these conversations with them. Oh yeah, hundred percent. It um it is it is interesting because you know maybe it's maybe it's not um, the five hundred dollar a month car payment, but maybe if you find maybe there's a car out there that's three hundred dollars a month, so you end up mm -hmm. saving your the two hundred dollars a month. Sure. You know that still is a significant amount of money over a long period of time, and maybe and I think as um as you know my friends and and students grow older, they start to realize that. You know, money isn't necessarily what they're after. They're more after time. It's how can I get my time back? How can I spend more time with, with my family and, and do the things that I want to do? And um, essentially money is, is time um, in a sense. You know, we're all, most people are spending uh, their time going to the job to receive a paycheck. Um, but if you, if you decide that, you know, you wanted to save more money than you do now, you're putting more time in a sense into your own personal time bank, um, which you'll be able to, to use at a different point in your life, um, to spend time with, you know, your kids or your grandkids or, you know, whatever your hopes and dreams are. That's such a great point, Todd. And I'm glad you said that because I was going to bring it up. It, you know, it's like we're, we're innately, we're, we're brought, brought up with this consumer mindset. And we're, we're, 
you know, we, we look at others and we see materials and we think that's the, that's what equates from wealth. Right. And, and as you just mentioned, as we get older and especially once you start, you know, getting married or having children or, or finding a passion that, may, you know, maybe it's travel or whatnot. Um, you know, it's just, you, you find that the more time you're spending at the W2, that means less time of your own that you can control. And, uh, and so it, it becomes a, a mindset shift where it's not so much the consumer's mindset about more so about how do I get my time back, you know? And um, so I, j I just love that. I appreciate you bringing that up because um, I know for me personally, that's one of my biggest things being a husband and a father is, just, you know, <laughs> how do I get more of my time back so I can allocate to my family? And uh, you know, it, you don't need the nice car. You don't need the materials, what, you know, but you only live one life and it's very, very short. It goes by quick. So, and, and I hope that the listeners, you know, called on to the fact that, you know, you're, you're 35 and had reached this financial independence. I mean, in the corporate world, you've just got, you know, 25, 30 years back on your life that other people are going to be grinding away. That's now time that you have. And, and granted, you're still working hard, no doubt, but you can <laughs> control your time now, right? Right. Yeah. I think it's kind of a mental shift. You know, it, it's you're we're used to being programmed to taking orders from somebody, you know, in, in elementary school, it's, it's your teacher, you know, you're trying to please your teacher. And then once you get into the corporate world, it's trying to please your boss. So you're always, always have somebody kind of over you um, controlling your actions to a degree. And as we, you know, progress in, in corporate careers and things, I would say that even most people's time becomes more constrained because, you know, as they're getting these raises and, um, and more corporate responsibility, that usually means a bigger time commitment too. Um, yes, they, they are probably making, you know, significantly more money. Um, but again, you know, at the end of the day, um, I know there's a quote out there um, that nobody on their deathbed has ever ever said that they wish they would have spent more time at the office. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, these people are, are trapping themselves into, um, into a certain path. And, and I personally, I don't like that. I like to have options. You know, I like to be able to choose how, how I spend my time and how I do things. And, you know, as, as people experience what, what we call kind of in the personal finance world, this lifestyle creep or this lifestyle inflation, um, you know, more of their money just, just becomes more allocated to their lifestyle and they become more and more trapped and, um, you know, they, they end up needing to work just to be able to survive and, and pay their bills without really understanding what they're doing to their long-term options in life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we, we've talked about this here recently on the show, but, uh, you know, just to go back, it just reminds me that you know, when you, when you're dependent on being an employee for somebody else, it, you're taking a gamble, you know, you're taking a gamble that in, you know, at retirement age, A, you're, a, you're going to still have a job, you know, as you get older, it gets harder to compete with the newer, younger talent coming out of, you know, with degrees and, and, and whatnot. But B, you know, you have a retirement account, you got to hope that it's, you know, the market's right for you to retire. And case in point, I mean, you mentioned the great recession. I mean, when I started my career, that was the, the big eye-opening moment for me was I started my career in 2008 and, you know, right in the heart of the great recession and people that were getting near retirement age, they were running around panicking because they couldn't retire. Their retirement accounts were just decimated, you know, and then we, we see that again here throughout the pandemic. I mean, you know, people that were probably getting ready to, to end their careers, I mean, are, are now, you know, in a, in a predicament, <laughs> right. And, and I mean, what I think at one point the, the, the stock market had dropped, you know, as, as much as 30%. And, and it's just, it's just a gamble when you have to depend on that and other people, um, you know, to hopefully allow you to, to retire or, you know, live that life that you want to live. So. Um, right. Right. Yeah. I think a lot of people look at, um, at their, at being employed as a safe option. Um, but I guess my experience wasn't that it was safe because, you know, I got laid off early on. So that really changed how I thought about working for a company and that, you know, they could kind of get rid of me anytime they felt like it, you know? <laughs> um, so I, I wanted to have that control and I wanted, wanted to, um, you know, pursue um, 
more of the self-employment path because I could, I know that I could count on myself and I could motivate myself um, to work hard and, and to provide for, you know, whatever and whoever I needed to provide for. But I didn't necessarily know that, you know, the leaders of any organization that I was working for would have my best interests, you know, at heart. Let's, let's, you know, kind of put it that way. And then you did touch on, on, on another part um, is about, um, you know, these, these younger, the younger population that's, you know, coming up and, and searching for jobs. Um, you know, a lot of the times that um, a lot of these older employees, you know, have been in companies for 20, 30 years and they have, you know, I mean, big, big fat salaries at some point. And you have a lot of hungry kids coming out of college that, you know, they're, you know, willing to take a significantly lower amount um, to do the same job, more or less. You know, I saw this at the company that I worked for that, you know, they loved hiring kids straight out of college because, you know, kids out of college, they didn't, you know, they just wanted their first job. They didn't really necessarily care so much about what it was or what they were doing. Um, and, you know, they were able to, to pay them significantly less and make the company that much more profitable. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely recognize that as well. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, and, and I think people, what makes people uncomfortable is, is, as you mentioned, relying on yourself. I mean, again, we, we, we brought up in this culture of being an employee and being a consumer and, and whatnot that you, it, it's hard to ch make that mindset shift, but you know, I, like you said, I, I have confidence in my skill set. I have confidence in my ability. And I think if, you know, it, it's, is it, is it comfortable at times? It's not, I mean, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it is, it's, but, uh, but man, it, it, there's so much more security and being able to rely on yourself and your work ethic and what, you know, what you can do uh, versus having somebody else tell you how to do that. So, but uh, uh, always love talking about this, man. It's so important. And, 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 cause, cause I do think that as, as over the years, I feel like when I first got introduced to the, the real estate entrepreneur journey, you know, back again, back in 2000. Uh, 10. I don't feel like it was as quote unquote mainstream if you will as it is now. And I think there is so much more information that's so readily accessible now to the general public. And, and I think that, you know, part of the reason of doing this show is, is to help educate others, but just really to, to hopefully open people up to the idea of, you know, getting out of that consumer employee mindset, understanding that, look, you don't have to live your life chained to an of W2 for 40 years, you know, and, and hoping that you can live the rest of your life the way you want to. I mean, why not now? <laughs> you know, as you exactly, mentioned, yeah. <laughs> I mean, 35, I mean, we're, we're all in the same age boat here, you know, age group here. And um, I mean, that's the goal is at 35 to be able to, to live life the way you want to and do what you want to. So um, great conversation, man. I love it. So yeah, nice. Um, but going back to your, your success, you know, and, and getting your portfolio where it is today and, and reaching that financial independence, uh, what do you feel like has been some of the biggest attributing factors into that success? Aside from just, as you mentioned, you know, being quote unquote tight wad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess, um, for me, it was, it was, um, you know, anytime that you're, you're doing something new, there's going to be highs and lows. There's going to be setbacks. It's just, just a part of the learning process. And, um, you know, part of it is just coming to terms with, you know, there's going to be tough days. There's going to be hard weeks where, you know, a tenant does something and, you know, just totally screws you over and it's not going to be the end of the world. You know, it, it'll pass in a week or two and, and you'll be able to recover from it. Um, so a lot of it for me was, was just persevering and just keep pushing forward that, you know, if, if, if it was an easy journey, then everybody would do it. Um, but it's not an easy journey. So it's, it's going to test you along the way to, to see how bad that you really, really want it. And what's, you know, that you're really committed to your goals and to your dreams. Um, so that, that was important for me. Um, also, I always, I always kind of had in the back of my mind that, you know, when I reached financial independence, I was going to go traveling. So part of my thought process was how am I going to be able to run properties when I'm halfway around the world? You know, how do I start solving for these potential issues that I'm going to see when I'm trying to live this lifestyle that I want to live? Um, so for example, one of, one of the things 
that I saw was property management. You know, how do I, how do I manage? Cause I, I was a self manager for um, the first eight years that I was running these, these properties. And, you know, I, I didn't know how exactly I was going to unload that responsibility while, you know, I was in a time zone that was exactly opposite of, of the one that we're here in the United States. I didn't want to take phone calls at, you know, noon here, but it was midnight there. Um, that, that didn't sound like my ideal lifestyle. <laughs> um, so it was kind of, kind of starting to, to think ahead and, and plan for how, how am I going to solve these issues? And, you know, being a tightwad, I didn't want to spend 10% or 8% on, on a property manager um, to take a significant amount of revenue from me uh, every month. So I kind of came up with the idea of, you know, what if I could hire somebody to just act as, as my personal property manager and, and just kind of pay them more on, on an hourly basis um, based on how much work they had to do instead of just, you know, here's a couple thousand bucks, you know, off the top of my revenue every month. Um, so I kind of came up with the idea of hiring a virtual assistant to monitor, um, you know, my, my email inboxes and, and my phone line. Um, and respond to every maintenance request that would come in. So I kind of came up with more or less a, a playbook on, hey, if this person calls you and they're asking you about this, this is the person that you call. And um, kind of laid out some different scenarios for, so that they wouldn't have to contact me. They could kind of operate independently on their own. And then of course, if they did need to get a, get a hold of me, you know, I'd, I'd be able to respond in a couple of hours or, or something like that. Um, so that really, really kind of allowed me to, you know, take a step back from the active management and be more of a, a passive manager, um, and also be much more profitable than, than I originally anticipated while we were, while we were, you know, off goofing off for, for, for a while. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I love that. And, and I tell you, man, the, the world of virtual assistants is, is such a phenomenal value add to your business right now uh, for anybody that's listening. I mean, you know, we utilize VAs in certain aspects of our business and, and the goal is to, to incorporate more as we continue to grow. But uh, man, what a, what a fantastic way just to leverage, um, you know, like you said, some, some, oppor some opportunities that are out there that, uh, you know, you don't have to ha necessarily have somebody in person that's, you know, in the office that you're paying a, a substantial salary for. I mean, you can, a lot of these virtual assistants you can do for, I hate to say relatively cheap, but I mean, it is, you know, and, and it, it's just an added way of you to be more efficient, as you mentioned, you know, and, and which is key. Um, you, yeah. I'd, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> I was just gonna say as, as a business owner, you know, the goal is not for you to control every aspect of the business, right? The goal is just to make it efficient. So that way you can continue to grow the business or, like you mentioned, you know, maybe you get to take your time and go travel or do whatever, but the business still needs to be run and it still needs to be efficient. So being able to be creative in that and utilize, uh, in this case, those virtual assistants is, is huge, man. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, virtual assistants, I think, is, is a game changer um, for, for most businesses out there. Um, you know, businesses that haven't gotten on the, the virtual assistant bandwagon, I think they're, they're really, you know, kind of behind the times at this point, because there's, there's so much that they can do and, and so many skills that they can offer. And a lot of these, a lot of these um, virtual assistants, you know, they do live overseas and, and we do not necessarily pay them what someone would earn in the United States, but it's still a very good wage for what they earn um, in their home country. And, and, you know, they're paid in, most of them are paid in dollars and the dollar goes far in a lot of, a lot of different parts of the world. Um, and, you know, again, you're, you're providing great employment um, to, to, you know, maybe a, a very needy family. Uh, mm -hmm. What are, what are some, some things that you guys use VAs for? In particularly our podcast right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. But the podcast does, uh, you know, all of our back office stuff, we have our virtual assistant that takes care of that. And, um, and it's, it's a huge uh, value add and time savings for us, you know, because it's instead of spending however many hours a week on doing all the back office stuff, you know, I can just continue to reach out and network and find great guests like you and, and whatnot on our various platforms while the back office stuff is being handled. And it's, it's phenomenal. So um, we're looking at VAs as well to, you know, uh, help us with maybe some deal sourcing uh, we've thrown around the idea of 
possibly you looking at underwriting as well. You know, <laughs> that that's one that not so reluctant to give away yet, but, uh, but you know, just <laughs> things like that. I mean, you know, it, it's, it's phenomenal. I mean, you hear people using them for, uh, you know, market, market analysis and market research and data collection and, and whatnot. So, uh, but uh, yeah. Yeah. I think with VAs too, uh, you know, people, what I've heard the best tips of advice from people that are really successful with them is, you know, try to use them to, to focus on the tasks that don't help you generate revenue. You know, as a, as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, you know, we need to be focused on the things that are going to drive business, right? So revenue generating tasks. And if you have some tasks, maybe it's, you know, updating your Facebook, maybe it's updating your LinkedIn, maybe it's responding to a particular group of emails. Uh, those are great jobs for VAs that can really leverage we talked about earlier getting back your time. Uh, and I think that's, those are, those are good places to start for anybody who's looking to, you know, get into the VA, uh, get into using a VA. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. I think, I think um, with, with everything that's going on with COVID it's kind of accelerated the whole, um, you know, freelancing and, and VA kind of market that's out there. Um, you know, when a lot of people lost their job, um, a lot of them, ha you know, had to had to find a new source of income, and a lot of people decided that, hey, you know, I can go try and be a freelancer on a lot of websites that are out there. You know, maybe there's a way that that you guys can can have somebody do like your pre underwrite, and you know, once they pass all the all the tests on the pre underwrite, then hey, then it comes to you guys to to really dive into it or something like that. But there's just there's just so many people out there that have such you know unique skills that, you know, are, are relatively affordable. And like you said, getting your time back, you know, there, there's no reason that, um, that most businesses can't use a VA in some way, shape or form to, to help them grow and, and to, you know, achieve their goals and, and what they're after. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And, and you alluded to this a minute ago. I mean, it, it, it's just a new way of doing things, right? And, and if you, if you really want to help yourself propel, I mean, you've got to be able to adjust and change with the times. And in this case, uh, you know, as you mentioned, if you don't have VAs incorporated in your business and you know, you're, you're lagging behind a little bit, you should check it out. So, <laughs> but, uh, well, cool, man. So listen, tell us a little bit more about what is on the horizon for you, Todd. I mean, what, what's, uh, what's left on your bucket list? Oh man. Um, I've been itching to get to, uh, to New Zealand for, for a while. Um, so that one's, that one's definitely on there. Um, my future uh, mother-in-law, she, she always teases me because every time that we go somewhere, she, she says, oh, you guys aren't going to come back. There's, there's no way, you know, like <laughs> you're going to be laid up on a beach, you know, and, and you're not going to be able to, you know, leave the coconut lifestyle or something like that. Um, but no, New Zealand is, has been high on my list for a number of years. You know, the, the natural beauty that it has to offer. And for some reason, I dream of um, of wanting to you know tour around the islands in uh, in a camper van and just kind of you know pull over to the side of the road and set up camp and you know be surrounded by all the natural beauty and and um, yeah, so New Zealand is is definitely high on my list. That's awesome. If you ever make it over there, check out our friend Hadar K or Kiwi. He's mm. a fellow real estate investor and uh, he, he's out there in New Zealand and he invests here in the states. And uh, you know we love sharing his story as well. It just trying to get people to understand, listen, there, there's no boundaries here. You, you, right. you know, you can, you can make this business, whatever you want. To do. That's, <laughs> that's great, man. That's great. So, well, listen, man, we're getting near the end of our time, unfortunately, and, and it's been a great conversation, but uh, before we do head out, we do have a couple more questions for you and then we'll wrap it up. So um, one of the things that we always like to ask people is, is kind of what are you doing for your continued education to kind of further your, your investing? Yeah. So I, I guess for me, um, I don't ever really plan on stopping the education process. I think there's always going to be more that I can learn or there's going to be ways that I'm going to be able to do things better. Um, you know, like with, with the virtual assistants, you know, that was something that just kind of hit my radar one day when I was listening to a podcast and, and I was like, huh, I can, I can probably, you know, really use a VA and, and they can really help me out. Um, so personally, I don't, I don't see that this is, uh, you know, an, a finite process to me it's, it's an infinite i'm always going to be wanting to learn i'm always going to be wanting to to push forward and, and see what else is out there um so right now you know um i have a lot of time on my hands um you know being stuck at home for the most part so that usually involves uh, a lot of a lot of reading um also you know when i'm out out running around or um you know at the gym or something like that i'm usually listening to a podcast 
Um, there's a, a lot of great courses out there as well um, on like uh, on a platform like a LinkedIn Learning or uh, Alinda.com. Um, and I actually found that that locally in my area, uh, the public library, um, if you sign up for the public library, they will give you um, a free account to to watch, you know, videos and take classes on lynda.com. Um, so I found that that's, that's pretty cool. And that definitely, you know, plays to uh, my tightwad uh, lifestyle here. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I'd say that, you know, anything that you can really get your hands on um, that, you know, can, will further, further, you know, either your business or your learning, um, then yeah, I'm all for it. That's awesome, man. That's great. Um, what have been some of the lasting lessons that you've kind of learned along this, uh, entrepreneurship journey for you? Oh, there's, there's so many. Um, <laughs> um, uh, let's see some, uh, I guess, you know, a lot of it is comes down to mindset in that, um, you know, whether you think you can, or you think you can't, you're, you're right. Whatever you convince yourself, um, that you are, or you are not, you're going to be right. Um, so for me, I always, you know, looked at, looked at myself as, as far as what I wanted and what I wanted to accomplish. Um, and, and I stayed the course on my goals. Yeah, there was, there was tough days, there was tough weeks, there was tough months, but as long as I was reviewing my goals and I knew what I was working towards, you know, that kind of fueled the fire, um, to keep, keep charging along and keep going after it and, and help you kind of get through those tough times, you know, um, having the goals, is uh, is a huge part and a huge motivator um you know understanding why you are chasing whatever it is that you're chasing um that's going to help you kind of get through those those tough periods of of the journey yeah man that's that's great that's great and and you kind of answered in a way my next question but uh, <laughs> uh what would be some of the, the advice if any that you would give to the listeners to help them grow their business yeah so i i guess um Growing a business starts with your personal business. And what I mean by that is your personal finances. If you're struggling to run, you know, your household and your personal finances, um, that's probably going to translate into how you run your business. So I would say, um, you know, getting your personal finances in line and in order is going to set you up for success when you, when it transitions over to, to the business that you're working in. That is such great advice, man. I, I really appreciate that too. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's phenomenal. So, well, Todd, man, tell the listeners how they can get uh, connected with you and learn more about you and your company. Yeah. So uh, the best way to connect with me is really on uh, my website. Uh, my passion project right now is tightwadtodd.com. And that's all about, uh, you know, helping people better understand uh, their, their finances and what's happening with their money and to make smarter and better decisions so that they can um, live a more fulfilling life and, and fulfill their dreams and have some, some great experiences along the way. That's awesome, man. Todd, we really appreciate the value that you're bringing to, to the community and, and just sharing your story, man. It's been a great conversation and uh, we look forward to, to continue, continue seeing your, your success and uh, hopefully seeing you get to New Zealand here pretty soon. So. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, guys. Really appreciate you having me on today. Thanks, Todd. Thank you. Thanks.